everybody, welcome to the fourth MyHR uh, Facebook Live session. This is our first of the new year, hard to believe um, it's already March actually. Um, a lot's been happening, we've been flat out since the last one, so it's good to be back um, and have some people interested and, and dialing in. Just want to let you know we're going to be doing this every month. Um, I'll also be on the road this year with MYOB every month out and about in small towns around New Zealand, so hopefully get to meet some of you. Ran a great session last week out in West Auckland, met about 50 um, very, very cool business owners. So yeah, stay in touch, look out for us and connect, um, and look for these Facebook Lives every month. We will be doing topics that are driven by your questions and things that appear to be of interest to you, um, and we can tailor the content. So um, find us like us on Facebook, look out for these. Um, they are available after the live, so if you have to go part way through or you know somebody else that might be interested, you can find us on Facebook or YouTube where these uh, sessions will be, um, will be stored. You can ask questions live as well, so please feel free if you're watching us through Facebook, you'll see there's a little spot there you can message, go ahead, I'll do my best to answer everything during the session. If we run out of time, we'll come back to you afterwards. If you don't want to ask something live or you think about something later, by all means jump in, um, message through Facebook and we can either pick it up at the next live session or we'll respond directly to you. You can direct message us too, so if you don't want your question to be in the public forum, by all means send us a DM and uh, and we'll get back to you. So it's great to be here, good to be kicking this off again. Today's a massive topic actually, we've got three there in the, uh, in the ad, and I wanna cover all three and give them all um, justice I guess, because they're quite important topics. So the first was the minimum wage and the impact of the increase this year and in subsequent years. So we have three years of stated minimum wage increases coming right through to April the 1st, 2021. Talk a bit about the labor market, and then focus on the big topic of key staff retention strategies. And there's a lot to say about this one. So look, let's jump straight into it. Around the minimum wage, you may or may not be aware that on the 1st of April this year, the minimum wage goes up to $16.50 an hour. Um, there's a blog I've written that's on our, um, on our website, myhr.co.nz. It does a bit of a summary table of the impact of this wage increase, the percentage increase for this year and then how it looks mapped over the next three years to get us to April 2021. Because in April 2021, the minimum wage will be $20 an hour. Now, as far as I can remember, this is the first time we've had three years of uh, minimum wage increases outlined in advance. Uh, there may have been a time in, the his in history prior to me uh, where this happened, but I'm not aware of it. Um, and this is quite significant. And what I want to caution you about is thinking that this doesn't apply to you. So employers that say, well, you know, we're not a minimum wage employer, we're in professional services, um, we don't pay anybody at the minimum wage, um, I get that, but this shift over the next three years is going to have an effect on most workers in New Zealand, I believe. So how that's going to happen is this, the size of the jumps for starters. So the increase to get from $16.50 in 1 April this year to $20 on 1 April 2021 means that each year the minimum wage will have to increase by around 6.5%. Often the minimum wage jump, aligned also with inflation of the year, um, are be benchmarks or markers used for other employees to negotiate their own wage increases. And whether that's triggered by a union or whether that's just the rise in professional service um, you know, uh, market relativity and value, um, people will use this as a way of saying, well, instead of jumping by two or three percent inflation adjusted salary increase, I'm, uh, I'm asking for six and a half percent because that's what the minimum wage is going up by. So it will affect the negotiating environment, I believe. The other thing you need to be aware of is wage relativity. So at $20 an hour, um, this is a rate that at the moment we see many mid-level sort of supervisor, 2IC type roles being paid at. Paid. And these are people with a bit of extra responsibility. If someone who's on $20 an hour today only increases by a couple of percent each year, um, it won't be long before the employees they manage are paid almost the same amount as them. And you can understand why people might think, uh, for the sake of an extra 40 bucks a week less tax, um, why would I carry all the extra stress, hassle and burden of, uh, of managing people? So there is a knock-on effect and I think you all need to be, and we all need to be aware of it and start budgeting. Look, the advantage to having this stated 
is that you can start budgeting now. We know it's going to be $20 by 2021. So build that in. That shouldn't be a, a surprise to any, anybody. A couple of tips around things to consider when looking at pay rises. We often have this discussion with our clients um, around you know, do performance reviews result in pay increases. We encourage you to separate reviews from pay discussions. Pay increases should factor in a bunch of things. Your own remuneration strategy, external market rates, average industry pay rise percentage, internal relativity, so what people doing the same job in your organization get paid, um, particularly as that then relates to things like gender, um, and just make sure that the internal relativity is pretty um, clearly not linked to those sorts of things. It's linked to value of job. Um, business performance, individual performance, value of the role, length of service, rate of inflation, resourcing needs, resource availability, and your business strategy. All of these things factor into a wage increase. So um, if you're looking to uh, increase people's salaries or wages, you sort of want to know maybe what you should do it by. By all means, get in touch. We can help. But just be aware of these changes to the minimum wage. I think it will have a greater effect um, on more workers than perhaps people are aware of right now. Topic number one down. Uh, so let's jump into the next one, the labour market. I'm sure you're all feeling this, you probably don't need me to tell you, but at the moment the labour market is quite tight. We here at my HR have written a thousand individual employment agreements for new employees in the last four weeks. So that gives you a bit of an indication of the rate of new hires that we are seeing. Um, it's significant, we're definitely seeing a bit of pressure through these changes in immigration law and um, people not being able to access labour from overseas in the way that they previously were. Um, there is no doubt it is a tight labour market. I mean, this really segues nicely into the, the main topic of today around staff retention. And that is simply because it's way better to keep good people than it is to have to recruit new people. So in terms of strategies to combat this tight labour market, number one on your list should be holding on to the good people that you've got. So I'd like to go through a few, um, I guess, tips, tricks, strategies around how you might do that. Uh, there are a couple of pretty comprehensive um, blogs on our website that cover this. One around identifying why people leave, which is pretty critical to then understanding how you can build a retention strategy. And then the other one is focused on how to retain good people. I'm not going to read these, they're there for you. I'll pick out the headlines, and then there are a couple of key things I wanna to touch on today. Um, and these are two things that aren't often talked about. One is around the um, importance of your basics, the foundation of the employment relationship. And the second is exiting bad people, because that has a direct effect on retention of good people. Um, and it's something that can be a bit overlooked. So firstly, it's just run through those points that are in the blogs. These are really uh, good pieces of advice and insights around why, firstly, people leave. Number one, of course, and I'm sure it won't surprise you, is that people leave because they don't like their manager. I think this is understood. The saying, people leave a boss, not a company, um, has been said so much. It is now almost a cliche. But don't be fooled. It's a cliche um, that is backed up by some serious data. Uh, this is still and remains the number one reason why people leave jobs. They don't like their boss. They can't work for the person for whatever reason. And in a tight labour market, to reflect back on that other point, um, you know, things like pay, getting the same package from somewhere else, getting, a, getting the same benefits, or maybe even getting a pay rise, it's, it's a given. So people are not worried so much about that money piece. It is these other factors, and boss is number one. Second, and not far behind it, is they don't like the culture of the company. And this is very, very similar, but it goes beyond just the individual manager. It's the overall... Um, vibe of the place, what the company accepts, its values. And I'm not talking just about those written values. It's very easy to write a bunch of core values and stick them on a wall, that's great. It's actually how those values are then um, interpreted and managed or uh, how they're um, acted on day to day. And if there's, a, if there's no alignment between what's on the fancy poster to what is happening daily, um, then people don't stick around. Um, culture is critical, and culture can be a little bit nebulous, I get that, but it's fundamentally just the feeling and the vibe of the workplace. Is this a good place to be? Does this organisation tolerate um, good, bad, indifferent? How do we reward success? How do we treat um, poor behaviour? That sort of thing. Um, third on the list is not being engaged. 
um, and it is just a disconnect between the individual and the organization, its strategy, uh, where it's going, uh, the job that they are doing, and that sort of thing. Now, one of the ways that you can mitigate this is just by better communication. You know, engagement is really about a connection and a relationship. And so what I always like to say whenever I talk um, to anyone is, remember the employment relationship is a human relationship. Um, it's very easy to get quite legalistic. You know, we sign a contract, we think about it in terms of these clauses. We all know in reality, once the agreement is signed, it goes in a drawer and it's seldom referred to. The day-to-day -day, um, employment relationship is a relationship between humans. Emotions come into play, factors outside of work. Um, and this engagement piece has something to do with that. If you are communicating to your people, you're more aware of what their wants and needs are, which flows into the next one around their expectations aren't being met. And this is quite a critical one, because often people read it and then I get comments like, well, what if we can't meet their expectations? Or a classic is we get the, well, you know, bloody millennials, we'll never meet their expectations because they want the whole world. And I, I, I push back against this. Um, people's expectations not being met does not mean you as an employer or a manager have to do everything they ask. You know, increase their pay by 10K, buy them a company vehicle, put a... Put a Space Invaders machine in the lunchroom, whatever it may be, any, any sort of things that you sort of think of. Um, it's actually just about being clear on, on what their expectations are and what the company can reasonably present. People want honesty. Um, you know, that's, that's fundamentally it. And if there is going to be a point in the future where the expectations of an individual start to drift away from what the company can deliver, way better to be aware of that. So let's talk about where you're at now I think we can give you some meaningful career development over the next couple of years. You'll be well paid for it, and during that time we'll extract this much value from it, so it's a win-win for everybody. There's a point at which you want to off-board and go and do something yourself. You know, travel the world, start your own business, receive a promotion, do a career shift, whatever it may be. Um, being aware of that now means that you can get value out of the current employment relationship, and you're aware of when that departure is coming. Not being aware of that stuff is when you get people leaving because those expectations are not met. Having a conversation about expectations being unrealistic is critical. You know, sometimes it is a bit of a reality check. You know, that they just need to be, there needs to be some sort of clear understanding of what they can and can't do. People will always fill a void. So if you're not talking about this, every employee will have a view on what they expect from the organization. So be aware of it. Um, the next one is being bored at work. I mean, nobody likes to be bored. We're not robots. You know, some sort of level of connection, engagement with what they're doing. I think this links back, and you're seeing a theme here around communication, but it's fundamental, right, in any relationship. Um, it, again, is one of the things that mitigates boredom really, really effectively is when people know why they're doing what they're doing. So even if the task is mundane, knowing that it fits into something that is bigger, that there is some sort of positive outcome. Um, if the job is naturally... Um, repetitive and mundane and there is a risk of boredom and therefore you know disconnection from uh, from it and, and high staff turnover find other ways to make life interesting if you can't fundamentally change the job that the person has ha having to do because it is just transactional by nature there are other things you can do um, you know play around with your break schedules consider things like the uh, the four-day week there's been a lot of a press about that recently, you know, things that you might be able to do that mix up the way your traditional work environment works to mitigate that boredom. And, you know, acknowledging that the job itself may be a little bit mundane, but there are certainly other things you can do. We spend a lot of time at work and you can make it a cool place. Um, number six, can't use their skills and abilities. Um, that is just that general sort of sense of feeling undervalued. You know, feeling like you've got more to offer and you're not being able to put that into practice. Um, once again, it may be that they um, are not in a position where they can do that right now. So this becomes a discussion about career development and moves and steps within the organisation. Opportunities to use those skills at some point in the future. If people are aware of that, then this comes back to that point around expectation. They have an expectation that it will come in the future. They understand that right now it's not there. And that is, that is pretty important. Um, another one that comes out a fair bit is not enough autonomy and independence. And this is another one of those contentious ones. There are certain organisations where there is limited autonomy and independence. The job is the job. You get told what to do and you have to do it. And if you don't, you run the risk of upsetting a process, upsetting a customer or creating a safety risk. So I get that. Um, 
But there, is all, there are always opportunities for a degree of autonomy and independence. And fundamentally what this is, is treating people like adults, right? You know, restrictive, overdone rules and policies that don't allow people to scratch their head without getting a form signed are what's going to kill this stuff. You know, so I try to make sure that people understand these things can be applied to all workplaces. Often workplaces that have um, repetitive roles dismiss these sorts of pieces of feedback. Um, autonomy and independence doesn't just relate to the job. Obviously, if you're in a company where you can give people autonomy and independence, where you can give them the opportunity to contribute, great, do it, go for it. You know, you'll get some great ideas. That is a, uh, it's a, it's a pot of gold. Your people know so much. In, in organizations where you can't and repetitive work is the nature of your industry, that's fine. Um, but there is plenty that you can do around the core job that deliver that sort of sense of being a respected adult to your people. Um, no career progression is another one. Um, once again, if you're running performance reviews, I'm a big fan of performance reviews, as you probably know. Um, I'll talk a bit about that probably in future uh, sessions as well. Um, this is one way of getting to understand that, and it links back to others around expectations and things. Um, performance isn't recognised. There's nothing worse than busting your gut and having no one notice it, or worse, someone else takes the credit for it, right? That is just an absolute killer. Um, and, you know, recognising performance doesn't have to be uh, through money, bonuses, and those sorts of things. It doesn't have to be formal employee of the month type thing. Sometimes it's just a, hey, mate, well done. Really liked what you did there. That was awesome. That can be all it takes. Formal reward definitely helps. And then there's that sort of zone between formal and informal reward where it's not necessarily a payment or a bonus, but it is, say, a perk. You know, once a month you give somebody tickets to movies or a dinner for two out or whatever it may be. And there is some sort of um, ceremony around that. So they are publicly recognised for what they're doing. Um, and the final one around the top reasons why people leave is that they're overworked. You know, that's a... Uh, that, that sort of tipping point around exhaustion, around... Um, you know, stress, overload, you name it, is a, is a critical reason. People just sort of get fed up. And, and smarter organisations that are thinking more about flexible work practices, um, this is where they will clean up in a tight labour market. Because people that just feel like that they are under the pump and under pressure the whole time will eventually burn out. Um, and that, these are things that you can avoid, even in high-stress, busy work environments. Um, believe us, we know uh, we, are, uh, we are an extremely busy business, but there are things that you can do to mitigate that sense of overworking people. So that's the stuff around, I guess, key reasons why people leave. If you are aware of these things, it can help enormously then in you thinking about strategies to improve staff retention. Um, the next thing from here is actually being aware of your staff retention. What is it? You know, how many people leave you each year? Is that an acceptable number? There is always a level of staff turnover that is probably just going to happen. People who will leave you to go and do NOE or will retire because it's, it's you know, they're, they're at sort of that stage of their life. Is it? There are a number of reasons why people are just going to leave your organisation naturally and they're beyond your control. So understanding that is quite important. Once you know what your retention is like, like anything, have a plan around what you want it to be. You know, it's just setting a target and then trying to meet that target, basically. So, you know, the anecdotes are, are, are potentially quite dangerous because it just fuels emotion. Oh, people are always leaving, or it's this sense that we're just, you know, retention is, is terrible and staff turnover is too high. Um, is it? What are your numbers? What do you want to be? If you're an organisation, if you're, if you're a small company of five or ten staff, or if you're a company of 500, how many people do you turn over every week or month or year? Um, what does that look like in terms of retraining costs, recruitment costs? Is it an acceptable number? Um, and if it's not, then what is an acceptable number and how are you going to get to that? So be clear on it. There's no point in having a, I guess, this sort of loose idea that you want to reduce staff turnover and without knowing what that reduction might actually be. So, how do you do it? Well, lots and lots of ways of doing it. Um, first is be proactive, right? Don't wait. <laughs> um, get out there and have a go. Um, proactive organisations are far more likely to be successful. And that is, you know, it, the, the nice thing about proactivity is it, can, it builds a lot of goodwill um, in our experience. You don't necessarily get everything right, you know, but if you're prepared to have a go, your people will see that and they will respect it. So proactive strategies, engaging up front, that's, that's enormous. Um, hire the right people in the first place. 
we did one of these on recruitment just before Christmas. So that's worth a watch. It just gives you a bit of a summary on how to hire good people. I mean, it's absolutely critical. Just calm down on the panic hiring. Honestly, if I, I know it can be urgent, and I know you feel like you need someone yesterday, um, but it is far tougher to hire the wrong person and then have to unpick that mess than it is to just wait another week to get, a new, get the right person on board. Take your time when you recruit. Um, and I won't revisit the whole how to recruit a good person, but I would encourage you to have a look at the other um, Facebook. Offer career paths and professional development that directly gives people a view of their life in this organization. Now, one thing I will say about this is, what about career paths and professional development outside your organization? This is particularly useful for small companies. So there might be a point where you know, a, a person should naturally leave you to go and get some skills elsewhere. Um, don't be afraid of that. You know, three years is a good length of time to have a person working for you. Extract value from them over that three-year period, and if they need something more that you can't offer because your company is too small, um, support them to leave. Stay in touch. Have them leave your organisation with a really clear sense of your values and uh, a positive view on who you are. And mate, in a couple of years, odds on they'll come back to you when you do have a job that you can offer them. Um, make it personal. Tailoring stuff to people's needs is not that hard, you know, and I'm speaking as someone who has come out of large corporates, very, very large corporates, employing 200,000 people around the world. Um, you can still make it personal. Everything does not have to be prescribed by rigid policy. Connect with and identify your people. If you're a small business owner out there, this is way easier because you already know all of your people. Um, but you can tailor stuff to people and their personal needs. Um, keep communication open. Communication lines are critical. It goes to all of those points I'd raised earlier. Uh, make work meaningful as much as you possibly can. Evaluate performance. As I said earlier, I'm a big fan of performance reviews because there are ways of doing it right. Um, and those of you who have seen me speak before um, will have heard me say, you know, there's been a lot of press around the, uh, the death of the performance review. Um, having come out of corporate, I like to say that this is not something that uh, I think has died by natural causes. I think, sadly, performance reviews have been more murdered by corporate bureaucracy. Um, we can do these so much better, and we should be doing them better. Fundamentally, they are conversations. So good reviews work. You just have to make sure you are doing good reviews. Um, and then reward success and understand failure. That is critical, you know, making sure that people are praised and that they are aware of it, and understanding failure. And this goes to um, my second to last and almost closing point, so you can all get back to your days, um, around understanding and managing failure. We talk about retaining people. What happens if you have a toxic person in your organization? Um, that will have an awful effect on staff retention. People will leave to avoid that person. So sometimes an effective retention strategy may mean dismissing somebody um, who just cannot be retained in the organization because of the way they behave. And my advice to you around that is once you've identified it, move quickly. Do it right, obviously. There are processes to follow. There's substantive justifications to upheld. That's why people like us exist to help you through that. But don't muck around. The damage that somebody that is that toxic uh, can cause on your organization is significant. But also a decisive move will really show that this is a company that values the right sorts of behavior. This goes back to that point around alignment with company values. If you let this poor behavior go on and on and on and you are too scared to deal with it, you're effectively condoning it. You're telling all your good people that, hey, this is okay. Um, and so move quickly and remove those bad people from your organization fast. And then the final point I make is just around some of the foundation stuff. Um, uh, as, as you know, I'm really focused on making sure that as a human resource function and as an industry, we deliver on all levels, that we are focused on not just the kind of nice, fluffy stuff, the, the culture, the engagement, the slides, the pinball machines, whatever, that, that sort of stuff, um, but also just about the kind of functional fundamentals of our profession. Um, the starting point of good engagement with people is to Get the basics right. Have an employment agreement ready for them before they start. When they turn up on their first day, be ready for them. Don't forget that they are, um, that they are actually starting. And believe me, this happens more often than you might think. Have all the stuff ready. Good quality induction. Make them feel welcome. You know, if they need a company vehicle or if they need personal protective equipment, whatever that is, it's there for them on their first day. They feel welcome. They feel like you've thought about their arrival. Um, and it's simple, simple stuff. It's administrative, it's maybe compliance based around signing forms, but it's all done. 
you, you, you put out a sense that this is a company that has a clue, that values its people, that wants to make sure that there is a good quality, solid employment relationship in place. And then from there, you can then build on those other relationship-based aspects. So the basics and the fundamentals around onboarding people and administration is easy. And the best way to do that these days is get help from technology. You know, why on earth uh, people still print and sign employment agreements is completely beyond me. But, you know, this is where tech can really help. It can make the smallest companies appear like the slickest corporates just by automating a bunch of that stuff. So you get those foundations right and it goes a long way to what comes after that. Um, there's nothing worse than putting a slide in because you feel like you have to have some fun in the workplace when the underlying message is that this is not a fun workplace. People see that as being fake. They see the thin veneer over what is essentially a, uh, a poor company culture. So get those basics right. Uh, key piece of advice. Um, anyway, that is 25 minutes. We have a question. Esteban's giving me a, um, a wave in the room. I'm going to uh, do my best to answer that for you. Ah, good question, Lucy. What is an average retail staff churn percentage for a year? Um, it varies quite a bit across retail. So um, particularly if you've ever worked in the service station industry, some of those sites operate at a sort of 120% staff turnover. You know, they turn over their whole team plus some. Um, I think if you're able to operate around 10 to 15%, that's what I would consider to be best practice. Um, I have worked in retailers before when we were around 18%. And if it got over 20%, we would like we, we would implement strategies to bring that back. Um, retail's unique in that, um, or it's a bit like maybe HOSPO and things as well, when you get a lot of transitional workers. One of the things, Lucy, I would advise, I think, in measuring um, staff turnover is break it out. And so this is obviously your gross staff turnover, the total number of people that leave your organisation. And that's an important number because it shows you what your associated recruitment and onboarding workload looks like. It's an important piece for your labour planning. But then within that number, extract those people that you could have saved. You know, and this is what you might do with customers as well. It's no different. So who are the people that left for reasons that we could not control? Moved overseas, moved out of town, retired, um, got ill, uh, were unable to work, um, those sorts of things. And knowing that there will be roughly that percentage of um, levers every year that you can't change is just an awareness that you have around resourcing for recruitment activities. Then those that left for reasons that you could have changed, they're the ones you really want to focus on to bring that number down. And good exit interview data will help that. Uh, get an understanding of why are they going to work for a competitor? Do they not like their boss? Do they not like their company culture? Do they not see career progression for them? Understand um, why? Now, I think, and as you know, some of my background is in retail, and I'm a big fan of retail industry for career development. It's an amazing place to bring people through. There are opportunities within stores and across other stores um, back through to head office. You can offer really diverse career pathways, and good retailers tap into that, and that does uh, a lot to retaining good staff. But yeah, I think if you're operating kind of 10 to 15%, you're in that in the ballpark of best practice. Um, 18%, like I say, we've, we've lived there before. Once you start pushing over 20, you know, one in every five people leaving you, that's getting a bit, uh, a bit tough. Thanks for the question. We all good? Yeah, that's it, folks. So hey, um, share it around. I will um, see you all next month. Mm -hmm.